Hello and welcome on in everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us again for day two of two with lettering with Hank Washington. Hank, how you doing today? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Glad to be back. Awesome. Well, before we get into it, I just want to remind everyone, if you're watching over on YouTube, you can jump over here to Behance if you want to see the main chat, the chat we're reading. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, we can see them there. Also, we're doing an artist spotlight today. So if you want to learn more about that, you can see the artist spotlight tab at the top of the chat. Read a little bit more about it if you want to uh, nominate anyone for that. And also, I want to say hi to our chat. Everyone who's in the chat, welcome on in. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what's up, Annika, Umacorn? I see Sin, Cody Bear. What's going on, everybody? Welcome on in. Uh, well, Hank, why don't you do... Um, a little introduction of yourself, maybe a recap of what we did yesterday and a little summary of what we're going to be doing today. Yeah, absolutely. So hello, chat. Hello to everyone that is watching. My name is Hank Washington. I am a art director, designer, and illustrator currently residing in the great state of Georgia, Atlantic specifically. Um, I am the owner and founder of Hank Design Studios, which is a creative studio that helps brands turn strangers into friends with design. And I'm also the imagination behind fuzzies, as you can see on my hat and sweater here and probably somewhere on the socials as well. Um, I'm the illustrator behind uh, Fuzzies, which is a culture focused project that's aimed to show the uh, bright and warm fuzzy feeling through his illustration. So, uh, yeah. And as far as this is a recap, um, yesterday we spent uh, some time working on a phrase called uh, Can't Fake the Fuzz, where we worked in Illustrator and we took some sketches, cleaned them up with some vectors and anchor points, and also used the blend tool to create uh, a nice little gradient pattern to also give it kind of a 3D effect. And um, today we're going to be focusing more on that to kind of polish some things up, but we're going to move it into Photoshop. And I'm going to show you today how to export your files from Illustrator as Photoshop files and also how we can add a little bit more flair and a little bit more fuzz um, in the in the Photoshop file as well. Very cool, yeah. So if you guys haven't seen Hank's work, definitely check out his Behance. Um, you're active on Instagram too, I believe. Yes, yes. And so you can follow me on Instagram at Fuzzies Co. Nice, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to get into it because uh, I, I was loving the style we had yesterday. Um, if you wanna bring up, uh, you're working in Photoshop today, correct? Uh, we're going to start in Illustrator, then we're going to move over to Photoshop today. Okay, very cool. So if anyone didn't see it, um, they'll be showing that shortly, but a lot of a really cool style going on. So I'm like, I'm looking forward to seeing that get kind of shaded and seeing what additional dimension that that uh, shows. And I can already see like the similarities to the work on your Behance, <laughs> like the, the big bold shapes and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so we can go ahead and jump into it. Um, so what I'm going to do is going to start in Illustrator. So um, for anyone that wasn't here yesterday or wasn't able to see the stream um, process that we got so far, uh, this is kind of the messy artboard of what we start from start to finish. Um, I feel like we're kind of light on this. It, it tends to go a little bit further, but I think for the sake of time, we're in a really, really good spot. So like I said, yesterday, what we started off with was uh, we took some sketches that was done um, off site, uh, very loose, like, you know, didn't have too many like restrictions on those. We just want to get like the overall composition together, at least close enough to where we can clean it up in Illustrator. And you probably can see a little bit faintly but you know we went in and added some anchor points like we talked about yesterday we we're basically just building the skeleton of these thick kind of like rounded letters um and then from there we started using the blend tool um to create kind of these nice little gradients and have these different color um shapes create one big whole shape um and replacing the spline of those vectors to give us kind of this really nice uh composition here so you can see there's some of those colors coming together. We kind of have this illusion of it feeling like a 3D piece, but all done in Illustrator and all done with vectors. So we're going to clean this up just a little bit, and then we're going to export this into Photoshop to give us a little bit more depth, just so those letters are really legible as well. Nice. Yeah, once you started using the blend tool, uh, the, the style was really coming together quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what I've done uh, here is I just created a new file um, and basically I just added for, for Photoshop in the file name. You can name it whatever um, you see fit. 
And what I've done here in the layers tab is all I just separated everything, right? So all the letters, individual um, collection of strokes are on their own separate layer. And you'll see why this is important when we move this over to Photoshop, but it makes it a lot easier to keep things organized. I'm guilty. I'm not a person that always names their uh, their layers. <laughs> so, so this is definitely like, it's not me, uh, but um uh, for the sake of the stream, I think we want to make sure that we're staying as organized as possible, just so you can see how the workflow of this is happening. So you can see here, I have, you know, shapes like the C. Um, there are certain parts, like, certain parts like the A and the N, which is all connected in one stroke. We just have that in one layer, which is completely fine as well. So if you're ever working in an Illustrator file and you want to move something from Illustrator to Photoshop, but keep, still keep the layers. It's really just as simple as going up here to file, hitting export and export as. And as you're saving it, you know, we won't go through the whole process it's because I have it open. Um, but you can just simply save it as a Photoshop file, which you can just see here in the format. Um, select the export. We'll just say replace for the sake of this. Um, and it's, it's going to basically take the same settings that you already have in Illustrator. So we're going to keep it RGB, not going to worry about printing unless there's something we do down the road. I think the resolution is fine for this case. And we're going to make sure that it's right. You know, it writes the layers because we don't want it as a flat image for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, so I won't save it here just because we already have it um, together. But what I'm going to do before we go into it, just kind of look through and make sure there's not any parts that's like, doesn't make any sense. I think, you know, maybe probably here in the A, I feel like this like top part here probably can go behind that little curve that goes into the next letter. So maybe we can just go in um, and switch those. And just like yesterday, again, you know, all these are just strokes with a blend effect to them. So we can adjust and move these as if it was, you know, a regular vector line. So we don't have to worry about changing like the outline and moving multiple anchor points. Um, to get the shape right. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's kind of a nice like things on here. Um yeah, I'm doing just scanning just to make sure that we're we're good on this one. Also, we're getting uh some compliments for the colors in the chat. Love the pinks, me too. The colors are so vibrant and fun, uh, from Cody and Penny. So yeah, people are taking awesome. the colors. Also, uh, we got some talk in the chat about naming layers. Um, and uh, Annika was asked, yeah, yeah, I am on the team name your layers. I, I don't know if we talked about that yesterday, but does it vary between Illustrator and Photoshop for you? And do you tend to name and organize your layers or is it just kind of whatever happens, happens? Um, that's a good question. It's it's not really about like the the software. It's more just kind of like the intention of the project. Um in a lot of cases, I'm usually working with other animators or other people who are, you know, involved with the project as well. So if I ever have to hand off a project, there usually is a big uh, motivator to like, all right, let's name these layers just so no one's like clicking around trying to find certain things. Yeah, um, but most times if it's, <laughs> I'm going to get to the save, if it's just for me or it's like, if I'm the only one that has to <laughs> handle the file, I'm keeping the layers as <laughs> one, two, three, and four. Yeah, I, I think there was actually a point where I was working for a company and I did need to transition my files. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if that was like a pivotal moment where I was like, I can't I can't let them see this. I can't let them yeah. see like layer 123, 124, copy, copy. Yeah, so, and they're like, like what? They're like, yeah. what's going on? Sam, I thought you were a professional. No, so right. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that was a point where I started transitioning, but I'm, I'm pretty uh, adamant on like, organizing stuff now but absolutely yeah, it kind of does depend on the file you know depending on like how much you're going to be working on that and how how extensive it's going to be absolutely absolutely now i think definitely the teamwork is a is a big motivator <laughs> in doing that but if it's not leaving my hard drive yeah we're gonna keep it as is yeah for sure yeah um so sweet. So um, what I've done here is basically when you save your um, your Illustrator, Illustrator file, your Illustrator file as a Photoshop file, um, again, like when, with the settings, we want to make sure that it's writing those layers. Um, and when you open up a Photoshop file, it looks 
nothing out of the ordinary. The only difference is like it does separate your layers as folders, um, which I'm pretty sure there's a setting that can that can fix that. But in this case, I think we're okay where we are. Um, so now we have the freedom to really hide and you know move those individual elements, just like if we were to build this out to build this out in Illustrator. I mean, in Photoshop. I'm sorry. Um, and just for the sake of this, we're just going to go through and just kind of rename these layers just to make sure. I tend to stay away from just like folders unless I'm working on very specific sections. Um, this is kind of my workflow specifically, but you know, if if you feel comfortable with folders, um, there's no problem with that. I think with this, because they're individual elements and the way that we're going to shade this, um, I like to keep the layers kind of just stacked on top of each other um, without any folders in between, just because it's a lot easier to kind of click through and not necessarily have to, you know, find certain things whenever I need them. Yeah. And so when you transfer this over from Illustrator, it looks like it, it rasterized all the layers, right? Like they're not smart mm -hmm. objects or anything like that. Yeah, it, it does rasterize them. Um, you can go in and convert each one of them, but I don't plan to scale or switch anything with these. So even if we do add the effects and then make the whole project as a um, smart object itself, that's been beneficial if you ever decide to print. Um, and even some cases there are now, you know, certain print companies that don't necessarily need the large file, but unless you're doing something that at a very large scale, almost like a billboard or like, you know, whatever the case may be, you probably want to make sure that your Illustrator file is already up to size. Um, so that way, if you don't plan to scale or move anything, you are already at the project settings that you need to basically take it to print. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing I didn't do, uh, as you can see here, I'm just naming the layers as the same as they were, um, but you can also do this in Illustrator um, to kind of save you a little bit of time. Uh, but you can also see this is the <laughs> the um, the punishment of my sins <laughs> with uh, lame, naming the layers. But again, just whatever is comfortable for your workflow. That's what yeah. I'm, yeah. Um, Penny says, I love layer 48 just as much as layer or layer one. I don't play favorites by naming them. There yeah, you that's, go. That's nice. That's good. I like, <laughs> I like the way that was put. Can't treat them like a favorite child. You have to treat them all the same. Also, I welcome on in to Sean. <laughs> absolutely now what i've gone um what i've done now is I, I just selected all the layers outside of their folders and i just copy them and what i'm doing is just hiding all the the folders themselves and we're actually just going to put this in a one big group and call it folders and i'm gonna hit shift command v just to place all those layers back into the same spot right on top of each other. So you can see none of them have moved. We wanna make sure like they're in the same exact spot, just so like now I can just kind of click on different parts that I need to um, select the, the what I need to actually make the effects or whatever I want in the Photoshop file. So it looks like, are you separating out each individual letter and um, punctuation as a separate layer? So not in each individual letter. Um, some cases they are um, one letter per layer, but uh, in a sense of like the A and the N, because I have it as one stroke in the Illustrator file, I just put that on its own layer itself. So as you can see now, I can just move that any way that I, and I want. That I want. Um, you can separate it by layer. Um, the only tricky part with that is that when you separate your anchor points, it does affect that blend in Illustrator. So you kind of have to be careful if you feel more comfortable separating it by letter, like that's completely fine, but just, you know, be mindful of the blend mode and the actual gradients because it can affect that. Gotcha, yeah, so it's kind of situational. Exactly, exactly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select kind of, I like to start from large to small. Um, so kind of my largest element here is the two Fs that are connected together. You know, they have a kind of this really nice blend of just these colors. But what we're challenged with now is legibility. So we do have a problem of these letters really sticking out and understanding what the phrase is. So if you haven't been watching the stream, it does say can't fake the fuzz. So but we're gonna to try to see if we can make that a little bit clearer in the stream today. So what I'm going to do is with the F selected, I'm simply just gonna press P on my keyboard to get the pen tool. 
Um, and we're going to treat this just like the Illustrator file. Like we're going to use strokes to kind of isolate certain areas. And we're going to use the brush tool, like a soft brush tool, to add a little bit of shadows. Now, everybody has different techniques. Like you can use the shadow effect on Photoshop. I tend to like to do them um, manually just so I can have a little bit more control. But in some instances, we may see that, you know, doing the shadow effect on Photoshop may work out better than maybe the way I'm approaching it. You know, because we're learning together as part of it. Yeah, a lot of that is a uh, kind of experimentation and finding, you know, which techniques really work in what circumstances. Mm -hmm. Just gotta, you know, you just gotta find your motion and find your flow. When you were talking about uh, legibility, it is kind of interesting because, like, if you know what the phrase is, you can see it when you look at it. It's almost mm -hmm. like it's almost like some of those songs where the lyrics are really hard to make out. But if you know what they are, you're like, oh, okay, I can hear it now. But if you yeah. just hear it <laughs> without ever knowing what they are, you might be like, oh, okay. It's almost Absolutely. like the visual equivalent. So it's kind of an interesting effect. Yeah. I think Spotify kind of saved our lives a little bit <laughs> when we were able to see the lyrics as we we're hearing the song. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think it's nice too, like to have a little bit of a mystery to it. It's like maybe it's less about actually reading what the word says, but, um, enjoying the form you know it's, it's almost like you know if you ever took painting like one of the things that like a lot of painting instructors tell you to do is like if you ever like painting an image or trying to replicate like a portrait or something um turn the portrait upside down so like if you grid it out like turn it upside down so you're not seeing it as a portrait you're seeing it as shapes mm -hmm. and you you know you draw it like that and then next thing you know you end up having something that like is a beautiful piece of work you know yeah that's a good point yeah Yes. Yeah, so what I'm doing here is all I did was drew a, a shape around just the area that I see that a shadow is going to be cast on. Um, you want to kind of just get as close as possible uh, to uh, isolate that specific area. And we're going to kind of repeat this process as well. Um, and when you make a shape, again, just using it the same way you use Illustrator with the strokes, uh, you can hold down command and press that layer and what it does it actually isolates that area based around your stroke so now if i add another layer on top of that which we can say this is the f shadow and we'll just call this s shadow one because it's the first one now i can go in i say i choose a color from my background just because you know we have already have a dark background um, I have a brush setting here. So if you hold control option and slide left to right or up and down, I can change the harshness of the brush and the size. And I can simply draw a shadow right into that area that's already isolated. So now I can kind of create this illusion of a shadow of these things overlapping kind of in my own way. And again, you know, everyone has their own techniques and how they want to approach it. It's completely up to you. Um, but me personally, I like to have more control over my shadows than anything. So this is kind of giving me that opportunity to create the illusion that I want. And now you can see like that shadow is in that area. And even though if there's a case that we want to change the background color to whatever, I still have the shadow on that specific um, letter and that specific layer in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of uh, manual painting of shadows in a very similar way. So mm -hmm. this is a, a familiar technique for me. Absolutely. And in this case, we can actually create our own group. So we can always say these are the Fs as well. And then everything you do, you can always add into that. Yeah, and then essentially, we're just going to kind of use that technique for pretty much the other spaces just enough so that we can give that illusion and give these letters a little bit more depth, um, you know, in our own, our own way. So now you can see kind of this overlap a little bit. I'm just going to kind of cheat just a little bit on this side. And again, your anchor points don't have to be perfect. You just kind of want something that's just close enough to give you the area. So do you always use the pen tool for these like precise selections when you're kind of masking them off for the shadows? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's super helpful 
uh, when it comes to just uh, getting precise areas. I don't have the steadiest hands, but you can also, you know, change like the brush um, settings to give you a little bit more um, like stability um, and smoothness when you're actually like drawing things, if you're drawing like a certain angle. Um, but in this case, because I am using solely just a mouse just for today, um, and the shadows are not too complex. Uh, I can just kind of rely on the anchor tool to give me an isolated area, and I can just kind of work based off that. Nice. Do you usually yeah. use a mouse for this technique? It's it varies. It varies. Um, it comes down sometimes to the convenience. So if I'm kind of like on the move and I'm creating something like you know traveling or something like that, um, it's usually the mouse or the keypad uh, to do it it's not always the smoothest <laughs> the smoothest approach but it does like give me a little bit of restriction and freedom at the same time um to get those like very intricate areas yeah for sure yeah yeah so essentially oh one thing i did wrong i just i put this on the same layer yes yeah, so you definitely want to make sure you're separating your shadows just in case there is um and it's you don't want your other layers to pay for pay for your yeah. mistakes. A little bit more flexibility that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there are certain things where I actually, you know, I have a tablet. I use it for most of my my work. But um, there is certain things where I do actually like the mouse. Like if I'm using the pen tool, I prefer the mouse for that. And yeah, certain like precise selections, um, the mouse is, is something I'll switch to occasionally. Yeah, absolutely. I think Sean's <laughs> saying I have an intense look. I think when you were doing the selections, I'm like really watching it, like almost as if I was selecting it. Like I got to focus on it carefully. Yeah. <laughs> There's occasionally times I'm using like the lasso tool or something and I'm like trying to get the selection. I'm just like fixated on it. Gotta yeah. It perfect. <laughs> now, early on, I used to spend hours on projects, literally just trying to do like direct select or using the one tool. I'm just like, there's gotta be a simpler way. And luckily enough, I was um, exposed to the magic of the pen tool in Photoshop to give me those isolated areas. <laughs> yeah, I think that works great for like this design since everything is so, you know, such smooth curves and everything like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, also, Carol has a question. Carol says, does he ever just clip these shadows instead of making new shapes? Yeah, so in some cases, yeah, if there isn't any over like overlap in the actual image. So for example, with the, let's say the, well, we say the F here, right? So because the F is imported as one image, like one flat image, there, I can't put like a shadow, like right under this like crossbar here. Um, in any case, I would just isolate it as well. Um, in this case, because I do have the shadows the same color as the background, I don't necessarily have to. But if there was a case as I'm like, okay, maybe I want to change the background to a lighter color, then like you said, like just having, um, using the clipping, I can just like put things in. Um, and it still gives me the same effect. It still gives me the same restrictions. But I'm not necessarily worried about like cleaning up the edges of where the shadow bleeds. It's more about like where it overlaps on the actual image. If that, if I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like when you have to create the overlapping shape yourself versus mm -hmm. when the letters are actually separate layers that are overlapping. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, like anything else, I'm pretty sure there's like, a much easier way <laughs> this one i bet the chat is like you know you can do this just like this but you know that's the that's the beauty of the live stream you can always you can learn with the community yeah there's there's been some moments for sure where i've been streaming and someone will be like why don't you just do this or have you thought about do, doing this way and i'll be like no i didn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i should try that yeah exactly there's, or if i'm watching someone else's stream and i see them do a technique that i've kind of done but they do it like in a faster way i'll be like oh man i didn't think about doing it that way or that hot right. key so i mean this is all stuff like the more you work you pick little things up here and there over yeah. time and your process gets more like refined your workflow gets more you know kind of um just made more efficient mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, I mean that's you know that's part of it because because these softwares are so 
you know, advanced and, you know, they have so many like hitting, hidden, like, you know, features and ways you can create things, you know, you just got to be kind of open to those nuances and, you know, have people in your corner that's like, yo, you, you are going <laughs> the farthest way possible. Like, <laughs> let me show you, let me show you a, sh a shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing for me at this point. Just like, if I can do anything that can just speed up the process a little bit. Yeah. Cause Absolutely. like you can create so much more that way, but it's, it's always a gradual learning process yeah. too. Also 100%. just a lot of experimentation to find out like what workflow like fits you, like feels mm -hmm. right to you. So. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, early on when I was um when I was getting out of school, I was part of an internship at a startup company um, that was in my college hometown. And um, you know, if anyone's worked in a startup or is working in a startup, they, you know, it is a very like fast fast-paced environment. So, you know, you're usually pivoting like, you know, on the fly, or sometimes you have opportunities that show up that like you gotta like, like, yo, I have to take advantage of this, you know, before it's like too late. Um, so early on, I was responsible for a lot of the creative opportunities that came in. Um, no like art direction, creative direction experience. So, you know, just literally almost like kind of throwing in the fire. Uh, don't recommend, by the way, but uh, part of that was kind of like the reason of like learning a lot of like the shortcuts and like picking up different skills, um, you know, just being responsible for those different mediums and learning those different mediums at a time where, you know, being a digital artist or being an art, uh, a creative online was new. Like that was like a, like a nuance at the time, um, which the kind of the first thing that like a lot of creators who've been in the space encouraged me was like, you know, be open to learning, you know, a lot more, like a lot of things that make your workflow a lot smoother or a lot quicker. Um, just because it's a game changer. Like you don't want to be stuck behind software, like doing things the long way, unless it's something that you enjoy. But if you're ever in a time crunch, there's always ways you can make things, you know, a lot smoother as well. Yeah. And, and there's always like these new features and tools coming out, you know, with each iteration of, uh, I mean, any of the softwares, but like AI is doing a lot of the work for mm -hmm. some things that you used to have to do completely manually. So it's good to kind of be aware of what's coming out that could potentially save time. And if you see that, be like, oh, okay, I think maybe that could speed up this part of my process and just be kind of open to, you know, learning those new things as they come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, at first when I was, you know, hearing about the AI, it was a, it was, definitely scary because you know there's always a fear of like you know what can ai replace but i think i think it's a it's a good thing because it's going to put us in a position where creatives who are just thinkers and who can really like um like come up with ideas like it seeing those ideas come to life can be a lot more efficient you know and i think that gives a lot of creators more opportunity to create things that they may it may have taken them taken them a long time um and like i said just take care of a lot of those mundane tasks that like slows you down you know in the sense of you know being creative so you know sometimes you just gotta kind of kind of be encouraged and look at it optimistically yeah and i mean just a lot of the ai driven tools in photoshop like a lot of the selection stuff where yeah i, I can get like 95 percent of my selection done with those tools and then just clean it up a little bit manually here and there rather than do the entire thing manually Right. Anything, exactly. anything that saves time like that could be, you know, game changer. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, kind of on the touching on what you just talked about, um, I was curious, what was your background before you worked for yourself for your uh, your studio and your Fuzzies brand? What kind of clients or work were you doing prior to that? Yeah, so um, when I left school, I was like I said, I was part of a startup. Um, it was a startup social media agency. So this was at the time where social media marketing was actually beginning to uh, become more of a thing. Like this is something more companies were investing in. Um, you know, it was really, really in their super early stages. So this was like Facebook ads and, you know, basically every social platform became a, a marketplace. Um, so when I left school, I started working there and it was just a team of just five people. Um, super small, but they actually grown significantly 
larger now. I think they're like at 70 people. So shout out socially in. Um, oh, wow. And they, at the time, you know, um, I was working there for about probably like three or four years. And I ended up becoming the, the art director one of, and one of the only designers there at the team. Um, so I was responsible for a lot of just the creative content that was going out on our client social platforms. And at the time we was working with a lot of local places. These were like local restaurants, local, um, you know, um, just like lawyer offices, you know, kind of small town businesses. Um, and we ended up growing and scaling to where we was able to work with brands like Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, we also maybe had a chance to work with the campaign for the Winter Olympics through Dick's Sporting Goods um, and a bunch of other like, you know, um, Fortune 500 brands. And um, my role was starting to evolve where I had more creatives come in to be able to, uh, you know, work under me and, you know, kind of play the art director role and also still help them kind of create like bigger campaigns and things like that. Uh, over time, we ended up moving because the, the company started in Mississippi and we ended up moving to Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, just to kind of get around some more talent. Birmingham was on this really big come up um, economically and, you know, the downtown area was just starting to evolve into something new. And I was beginning to do more things like on a freelance level. Um, I was still doing it, you know, while I was working at the agency and Luckily, my the company was very encouraging, um, or was very supportive about being, um, being kind of your independent self. Like, always have something that you can like fall back on. And like, they always mm. gave me a lot of like uh, pointers and just tips on what it means to like you know have your own business. Um, and you know, being a startup, you're able to see everything. Like, you I've saw everything from like the hiring process, what it means to like close deals. I've been in meetings where I've been like, my palms have been like drowning in sweat <laughs> and pitches. Um, and I got to see a lot of that. Right. And that, that kind of opened my eyes to like what opportunities could look like as a creative. And I started to see things like what I started to see more of like what not to do um, and things that like I can take advantage of as being like a, a freelance designer. Um, fast forward, you know, it's 2020. I had just started, I had started Hank Designs while I was working there, you know, things were going great. I was doing the nine to five, five to nine um, type of things and kind of just growing um, notoriety and things like that. And 2020 came around, I ended up going full-time independent, uh, which was scary at the time. This was like in the midst when everything was shutting down. Um, so you can imagine seeing all, <laughs> you turn on the TV or any type of news is like, it's red all over the screen. And then you're like, oh, I'm about to go independent. Like this might not be the smartest decision <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, but it ended up being the best decision uh, from there where I had a lot of great opportunities um, to work with just some major brands and just really great people overall um, that I wasn't able to work with before. And ultimately it, it allowed me to, you know, one kind of learn what it was like to, uh, run a design studio. Um, I got to meet a lot of great people in the space that were super helpful. They gave me a, just a lot of game, just about like things to look out for and things to start thinking about when it comes to like, you know, scaling and how you create processes and ultimately be someone that people can rely on creatively. Um, then ultimately moved to Atlanta, Georgia to where uh, I'm living now. Uh, and just, you know, held onto a bunch of relationships, still got a lot of great relationships back in Birmingham and in Mississippi, um, but was able to create relationships across, you know, the, the nation and um, really across the world now um, to be able to like continue to be pushed creatively, be inspired creatively, but also be kind of a light, um, especially for, you know, young black creatives who are trying to get into the space or trying to learn it and navigate it. Um, like now I'm kind of like on a mission to be an example, um, to show people like what they can be and hopefully much more. Yeah, that's awesome. That sounds like your experience with the startup, like it was a really good one to kind of have the tools and stuff you need to kind of go off on your own with all the all the things you were able to see and learn from it. So yeah, absolutely. It no, it was awesome, man. I, I, I would never uh, take it for granted for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good lessons learned. Um, Annika was saying one person knows all every startup ever. Yeah. I think, uh, I think working at a startup has to be pretty, pretty interesting in that way. Cause you get to see so much of like 
everything. It's not like each department is so isolated, like bigger companies, you kind of get to see how everything works. So absolutely. Sounds like a valuable experience. A hundred percent. And it's great too, because you, you know, you're able to like ask questions, you know, in some places, like you can ask somebody, but most cases they have to refer to someone else. And it's kind of this long chain of command, which, you know, there's, you know, nothing wrong with that. If that's the space that makes you feel comfortable, but I think there's something unique with a startup that allows you to like really be in the weeds and understand, you know, what the CEO is thinking, like at the moment, like I've, hung out with you know the owner of the company we're still great friends to this day um and you know he shed a lot of light of like hey you know if you going into this like think about this when you're um you know when you're working with talent or you know if you're trying to win a deal like start thinking about these things or if you want to scale so um and luckily enough like you know we've had other i've had other creatives that worked under me that had the same type of relationship as well and they've gone to do great things as well so um still a lot of great talent out there for sure. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, and that's the thing about like smaller companies. A lot of times people talk about like their big dream companies to work for. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And sometimes I think people overlook like the smaller companies, but there are a lot of perks to, to smaller companies because a lot of times you'll wear more hats. So you get to do a little bit more like variety of work, um, which can be often interesting if you don't want to just be kind of pigeonholed into one thing, but you often also have more influence, like more pull, you know, yeah, at a small absolutely. company because you're you're a larger percentage of the team. You know, if it's if it's just a handful of people, you may be like 20 percent of the team. Yeah. Um, whereas if you work at a massive company, you might be like less than one percent of the people working there. So, yeah, it, it is cool to be able to feel like you're kind of shaping the direction of the company a little bit more at those smaller ones. Yeah, Absolutely. And especially like when you're, you know, when you're moving on, like, you know, if you get to a point where you've worked for the startup and, you know, you go into whatever your next venture is, like a startup can show you so much about like your specific space that literally give you, that equip you with the tools that you need to like, you know, stand out anywhere. Like I've seen more people like get like great positions at bigger companies because of their background working with a startup. Like if you're able to see the ins and out and understand the ins and out, ins and out of like how a business is built, how it evolves, how it, you know, maintains and scales, like that is knowledge that is unmatched compared to, you know, someone that's just, you know, coming out of school or anywhere trying to get, you know, a job as well, which is nothing wrong with that. But I think there's just a big, you know, there is a big difference and it's, it's, it's super hard to ignore. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't really thought about that. Like working in a smaller company is going to give you a, a more intimate knowledge of the pipeline and how everything flows, which is valuable to those larger companies. If you kind of, absolutely, because a lot of times in those larger companies, the work you're doing, if it's informed by the workflow and like the pipeline in terms mm-hmm. of what do you need to keep in mind for the work you're doing to make it accessible for the next person who it's going to be handed off to that kind of thing. Yeah. That can exactly. be a, a great insight to have. Exactly. So definitely if you're, uh, if you have an opportunity to do the startup, do not ignore it. It is risky. <laughs> I don't want to ignore that. It is risky, but it is, it can be a hundred percent worth it. Yeah, I kind of am coming from the background of uh, like concept art and stuff like that. So, you know, in the past, I've looked at a lot of game companies and I think there's these giant game companies that like everyone wants to work for. Like if you're like, what what company you're trying to get a job at? It's always like the same few ones, which I think is common for each every industry. There's always like these big dream companies that everyone wants to work at. Yeah. But, you know, over time, like as the years have gone by and time has gone by, like if I was looking for that type of work right now, Um, I think the smaller companies seem more appealing because it's like, I don't want to be as much of like a cog in a machine type of situation. I want to feel like I have more influence on the game, for example. And, you know, there's so much, um, there's always so many startups. I mean, it depends on the industry, what's going on, but like, you know, VR is a thing Mm -hmm. that a lot of companies are exploring now. So there's like a lot of small teams for that. And I think just when you're in one of those teams, that's like trying something new and it's it's in the beginning stages, that seems Mm -hmm. like the most exciting stage to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's and and it's yeah, that's huge. Like like you said earlier, like having that pool, like you are in a space where you can literally express an idea. And most companies they have the agility to be like, you know, let's try it. Like let's just let's just see what happens, you know. And 
you know, sometimes it works and, but you also have the beauty of not seeing it work to know how to like, all right, if we're in a situation again, or we see this opportunity again, you know, now we know what to stay away from, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I agree a hundred percent. See. So again, we're just kind of moving along here. You see, it's kind of still a little bit rough, but we're, you know, kind of shaping up the Fs a little bit, giving it a little bit of dimension. As you can see, this probably still blending in a little bit. Um, but just in the case that we don't get through the whole thing, I can kind of show a, a kind of a neat effect that we can give it kind of that fuzziness texture, um, mm -hmm. but with the tools that Photoshop allows us. So what I can do here, if I have this F selected, I'm basically going to go up here to um, noise, and then we're going to go ahead and add a noise effect on here. Um, and I already have it set to 3%, just experiment with it before, but you can see it kind of gives this really nice grain, like super subtle. We could probably could tone it down just a little bit. Maybe we go like 2.5. Let's see, 2.57, we just do 2.5 in general. You know, just kind of soft enough to really give it a little bit of texture. Um, and like I said, even in the case we don't want to have a lot of these layers, but we can also have the same type of effect. So most times when you can select some of these, let me see if this works. Okay, so it doesn't do it as that, but can we you... can do a short key. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, can you add um, noise to an entire folder? I guess it would need to be uh yeah no i'm not sure if that would work we could try it let me see um, that, i guess usually i do that via adjustment layers or gotcha yeah gotcha i don't think it allows the entire folder yeah but i didn't think about adding an adjustment layer though let me see let's see does it give us a option but gives us a pattern and a gradient yeah i don't think um i think noise is done differently but uh mm -hmm. yeah i guess yeah. there's different ways to add noise so <laughs> now i'm wondering yeah. if there's something you could overlay over the whole folder but yeah not too yeah sure. that would be convenient though if you can add it to the whole folder so that way it's like <laughs> you know you don't have to um do things individually but there is a short key um, which honestly I've never used it before. I'm actually finna try it now, which is I think it's like, oh yeah. Let's see, is it? Let's see, is that shift? Is that referring to shift or is it shift? Command F. Yeah, I don't know what that symbol is. You're on a. It looks like you're on a Mac. Um, I don't have that symbol on a uh, Windows. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see filter. Let's just see what it does. Yeah, I'm not too sure. It may be one of his alt. Alt command F. Nope. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure what that is. On... Oh, okay. It's control. Gotcha. Oh, That's what it is. Okay. Ah, okay. I see Makes what you're sense. doing there, Photoshop. <laughs> you sly goose. Gotcha. Oops, move the background. Okay, so then now we know the short key. So if you're on a Mac, Control uh, Command F actually applies an effect, so that way you don't have to go to the layers. So now you can kind of see that we have this kind of fuzziness and texture that mm -hmm. we can apply to all our shadows, which is something we don't have to do now. But I think being able to see it um, before we move on to the other layers, I think is like really nice. This let, lets us know like we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and we also can, you know, work with blend mode. So if we ever see something that's like not working, which I don't think a blend mode will work in this case, uh, we'll just kind of keep it you know, all normal. Um, but we can always go back and fix those as well. Nice. Yeah, it's nice to have that flexibility. I play around with that pretty often. Um, like I have this similar technique for adding shadows, but I always just use multiply layers. So that's like my mm -hmm. preferred way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something I, I haven't like, exp like experienced enough with, like actually drawing on a multiply layer. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've just been so like used to finding the right color 
in every situation yeah. versus like actually blending the color, which is actually a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think about that. So, well, there's so many ways to do shadows. Like I know some people use like exposure layers where it just darkens it down. But what mm-hmm. I like about multiply layers is it keeps that information underneath. So if you have a gradient or you have a texture, it's still going to show that it's just going to darken it down a bit. But what's nice is you can select the color of the shadow essentially. So if you want like like you're using a purple and that's what I use too, like a, mm-hmm. a cooler, like purple shadow tone. Uh, but you could mm-hmm. also make warm shadows and you know, really whatever you want. So I like the flexibility of them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I definitely have to start putting that into the workflow. So now what I'm going to do is, um, I'm so what I'm doing is looking for opportunities, right, that I can... Um, kind of simplify the workflow. So what I'm going to try here is with this crossbar, because it's only going to affect the shadow right here, I'm just going to add like a regular drop shadow. And I honestly think I can pull from here. So actually kind of another quick like trick uh, trick that I thought was super useful and helpful for me, at least. Um, if I ever want to just add effect to like a layer that's really close, if I don't want to go through the whole process of like clicking here and go finding the same effect, you can actually hold down Alt, Alt and drag that effect to the layer that you want it to be the same. So that way you don't have to, you know, repeat that same process over, which I thought was pretty neat. Yeah, that's great. All those like little time-saving tricks. Yeah, game changer. Yeah. Also, Carol says, um, okay, yeah, I think Carol's bringing up that you can, um, for shadows, I think, Carol, you get this from uh, Val, right? Because um, I know Val, she likes to use the dissolve brush, like the mode um, dissolve on her brush for doing shadows. But I think you could also mm-hmm. just switch the layer that you're doing shadows on to dissolve and it would have the same effect, I believe. But yeah, it kind of gives like the dissolve has that more kind of um, almost spray paint you know, little mm. dots effect. So it has more texture, but yeah. Gotcha. Kind of a stylistic thing. Gotcha. Yeah. I do. I do like the dissolve effect. It, it is a little bit, you know, it's weird to say it's, it's a little bit too fuzzy for me. I don't know. That sounds blasphemous. I don't think I should <laughs> say that, but, <laughs> um, but too I have fuzzy. used it in certain cases, but I think it, it does work well. I just haven't like found like a lot of like great opportunities to use dissolve, but it does, she's 100% right it does make the same effect and I think it does a great job um you know I think it's just one of those things like you gotta kind of find the right space for it yeah there is a certain like sharpness to dissolve like the texture I'm not sure if yeah. that's what is too fuzzy but yeah it has, a, it has a certain look that you gotta kind of be going for yeah absolutely and I've seen amazing projects where they've used that technique of dissolve you know? so I definitely know it works yeah. And I mean, it's like, we've talked about several different ways you can just do shadows. It's like the same thing, but there's mm-hmm. so many like blending modes you can use brush styles, colors. So yeah, it's really just kind of like finding what, you know, fits with what you like. So it is Absolutely. nice to have all the options. hundred percent. So like there's more than one way to cook an omelet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially, like I said, we're just kind of going in. Just adding an effect. I thought the shadow and kind of the clipping mask would work, but I think because we have so many like cross crossing areas on these letters, it's kind of tough to kind of get it like exactly the way we want it. But I am not ashamed. Carol says you could probably blur it a little bit too to soften the fuzzies. You're saying um, with dissolve, I think, Carol, I had that same idea. I was like, I wonder if you could like, you know, just, I don't know, blur it after the fact. Yeah, I think, I think so too. I think that's like, again, I think one of those things where it's like, well, actually, no, let me take that back. Cause I think if we can blur it while it's isolated, it actually feels better. Look, look at, look at us, look at us, hey, <laughs> look at us just out here, just giving out just great ideas. No, I actually like that a lot. Um, Maybe we just blur just a little bit, just so it's just like hitting those edges. It still gives it a little bit of an effect, but I'm okay with that. 
maybe we just kind of soften these edges up just a little bit. You know, and again, like this is, it is very, it seems very tedious, but you know, I think it's, these projects are really nice where, you know, you have a really nice, like, um, like podcasts or like a nice lo-fi playlist that you just kind of like, all right, I'm just burning some time. It's, it's looks like it's about to rain here. So this is actually be a perfect, like nice project that selfishly I might not finish just so I can have this to work on later. <laughs> yeah. Get in the zone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's certain things like if you're doing the same kind of process repetitively, um, like when I do it in the beginning, I notice it seems very tedious. It takes a while, but it's like, once you do a few of those projects, like you, all your hot keys get knocked out and you just like, your hands are almost like just automated with all the keys yeah. they're hitting really fast. And it just becomes kind of second nature. So absolutely, if you do, if you do something a lot, you tend to get, you know, pretty quick at it. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. I actually really like adding shadow too. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite steps. Like when I do character art and stuff, when I get to get to the step where I'm adding shadows, like I, mm -hmm. I do my lighting layers and I, I put my um, shadows on a multiply layer. I usually do like my lighting on color dodge layers just to block mm -hmm. it all out. And that's like one of my favorite steps where I just get a start adding depth because it comes together so quickly. Mm. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm actually like really curious because, you know, and, you know, we talked about this offline, like, you know, I'm, I was a huge fan of your work, especially like, you know, on your Instagram with the um, Moon Knight piece and oh, thanks. that style of like illustration, I thought has always been like, um, you know, super interesting to me. So I was like curious, like, what's, what's that process? Like, like, what does that look like? How do you like, because I saw the build up, and, you know, I thought it was like super dope to see kind of where it starts from. But I, I'm curious, like what the thinking is to start from kind of this blob of paint <laughs> in the shape of what it looks like a person thing to end up with something that's like well this is actually pretty dope yeah I think it's it's like a lot of discovering a workflow I mean it's been like years that you know had to figure out why do I do each step that I do mm -hmm. um and I kind of go from like line art to flat colors to blocking in my lighting layers with the multiply and color dodge like i mentioned and then mm -hmm. painting on top of that opaquely to finish it but it's like you kind of have to discover that stuff over time like each mm. stage of the process has a reason and that reason came about from solving a problem that i had previously so if mm. before i was like i always get stuck on this or whenever i get to try to lighting it it looks really bad and then you're like okay why is it looking bad what can i do to solve that and you slowly kind of work your way into this process where each step has a very specific reason because it you know accomplishes something. So mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I think my whole thing now is basically trying to visualize the finished product as early as possible. So mm -hmm. I try to block in every element of the piece um, in a very, very rough way. So I'll do like a very rough sketch, a very rough flat colors, very rough lighting layers. And when you mm -hmm. have all those elements together, even if they're very loose, you can kind of see what it's going to look like finished. Like you can, you can tell mm. if this is working or not. And then mm. the nice thing about that is once I realize it's not really working, I can find out which one of those steps is it failing on? Like, is the pose really bad? Uh, is the perspective off? Are the colors not good? And I can makes go sense. and just change that one thing that I didn't spend a lot of time on because it was so rough. So it's, it's kind of, I guess my whole thing I'm trying to say is just, I try to visualize it as early as possible but mm -hmm. you're always learning lessons about your process and seeing what works and what doesn't what you can make work a little bit better and i think that 100%. stuff just adds up over the years until you kind of you know find what you i mean it never ends i guess i'm always trying yeah. to learn more <laughs> absolutely I think, I think that's uh something most creatives can relate to it's like it never really ends never ends it never ends I love this. I love the form you're getting on this. Yeah, I think it's um, you know, as so as you know, we listen to the chat and like hearing everybody's suggestions. I was kind of like, you know, let me try some of this stuff. Like, let me make sure I'm not like <laughs> being creatively selfish. <laughs> um, you know, kind of soak in some of this uh, these good ideas. So yeah, I'm just kind of like I'm actually trusting the the uh wand. Uh, selection one here just to kind of give me a nice little isolated area uh and i'm just kind of going in and just kind of just brushing and 
using kind of what you say, like some blended layers and just kind of seeing how that reacts to some of these things. It almost has me thinking like I may need to go back and uh, <laughs> and tweak some of my previous shadows, but you know, that's part of the, you know, the learning part. So it's good. You know, we kind of seeing like, hopefully like the viewers are knowing that like we're not going to be here to be perfect like we come in here just to like showcase what we already know and then ultimately like show that we have the ability to learn you know which is huge yeah it's always fun to play around with pieces and kind of see where they can go yeah. i like that um it's kind of in the, the corner of that shape on the left side but like that there's like a warmer pink around the edge mm -hmm. um, yeah and that's a look I always think it's cool because it's like if you get that color in the core shadow uh, of the kind of around the edge of the shadow, um, a lot of times mm -hmm. it almost makes the object look like slightly translucent. Yeah, which is kind of exactly. a, a neat effect, like there's light shining through it. So that's cool looking. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so I think that's kind of be something. And we honestly, I see that we're spending a lot of time in the F, but I think it's worth it because this is like a really neat like technique. I think that is bringing this to life and it's good that we're doing it here like on the biggest piece because again like as we work small or smaller um we're actually like, like you know creating solutions for those really intricate areas as well mm -hmm. do you have a favorite part of the process like in terms of color adding color or adding shadow or just like the beginning sketchy um concepting um yeah i think I think like adding color is probably the most fun and probably the most intimidating part. I think because, you know, regardless of like how your forms or whatever it is that you're making, like color can literally make or break, you know, your your pieces in cases. Um, and sometimes it's like, you know, you can say like type and anything else can uh, be a part of that. But I do think like, when it's things that I feel like a little bit more quote unquote, like artistic, like projects like these, um, I think the color effect is probably the, my favorite. Um, and being able to like add a sense of, of like a story or a feeling with color, which is very in, in, intimidating, but it's like super rewarding. Like when you, like when you do it right, you know, like when you're able to like, you know, convey the message that you want to convey but in a way that's not so literal like with words it's more like all right i have i'm provoking a feeling through you know different tones and multiply layers and blur effects and things like that all with like under this umbrella of color you know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean that makes a lot of sense for your work too because your work like color is such a defining aspect of it it's mm -hmm. it's what makes up the style and in, in a large part so yeah, I can see that that would be like a, a really definitive and fun part of the process. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, you can see kind of like some of the, I don't even know if like, oh wait, I did not think about that. Also too, like just the use of, um, like the alt key where you can like choose the different options of certain tools is another like really big game changer, which I don't think this is working as well. Um, I'm trying to just see like kind of a nice way to really, this is just move, um, isolate this part, but you know, I think it might not be the case, which we can simplify it, but it looks like it's, oh, I'm no wonder I'm on the wrong layer. Um, yeah, it looks like it's not forgiving, but I think that's okay. I think, you know, ultimately we're still just getting that story across. And now I feel like I need to like go in and multiply all these layers just because <laughs> it looks so much better. Yeah, kind of a different stylistic look. Yeah. Yeah, a little darker, but you know, I'm I'm okay with it. I think it's it's still in, invited to dinner. This is making me want to do like, I've never done a lettering piece ever, I think. But like when I saw you doing this style yesterday where it's like these big kind of um, rounded looking shapes, like instantly I was like, man, I, I kind of want to try this just so I can like shade it because I, you know, I love doing, <laughs> love shading stuff. No, go for it, man. <laughs> I, I don't, trust me, I don't, I can share you the, this file, man. If you want to just get, use it from a blank slate, like <laughs> let's make it happen.
Yeah, it's a re- it's a really cool effect. Hundred percent. Yeah, I like, think it's you know, super. It feels soft. It's almost like I I like to create yeah. things that you can like really feel. Um, you know, they kind of make you really like really like like the warm and fuzzy feeling is literally like what inspired our names like we want to create something that makes you feel something that you, that you don't even or you're not even able to touch you know yeah and it's it, it's cool because like so much of that effect is already kind of present even before you got mm-hmm. to this step of adding shadows so it works Absolutely. really works well and also um annika did mention uh the artist spotlight just a reminder to everyone we do have that coming up in about 20 minutes or so uh, we'll be jumping into artist spotlight highlighting someone from the community and if you want to uh, learn more about that there is the artist spotlight tab up above above the chat yeah absolutely um and even too like it's one thing i like to do is uh usually i try to do my highlights last um that's kind of i don't know if that's like a um kind of a, like a normal process for a lot of like illustration or just anyone that that works in like shading or anything like that. Um, like I think the highlights are kind of like that, like sprinkles on top of a Sunday, you know, type of thing. So usually shadows can like tell me a little bit of, all right, this is where this is going. So now I know kind of like if a light was shining on this, like do we want to make this like more polished? Does it feel, does it need to feel like more like a like a plastic or like a nice like metal or like a mat or whatever the case may be. So usually I try to keep the, the highlight portion last on, most cases, not all cases, but most of them. Yeah, that's a, it seems like a common workflow with people. Like they save the highlights to the very end. I think it's it's a good idea because it's usually like a subtle effect. It's the shadows yeah. do the bulk of the work and highlights are just like a little touch on top afterwards. 100%. And you can also see like just how easy it is for, um, you know, these layers to really pile up <laughs> once you like really get into shadow because you, Obviously, you want to keep things like separated as much as possible, um, but you can see like that can add up and yeah, yeah, a little overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many like separate shapes you got to kind of mask out and yeah, uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of overlapping yeah. shapes happening. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, if this was kind of like more on a on a time crunch, then you know it'll be. A little bit different, like you know, pulling this into uh, like a 3D software, which most of them do work pretty well with like just anchor points and just splines in general. Um, you know that that's kind of the beauty of just like working in Illustrator or creating these in Illustrator is that you can literally pull those points and build like these bold shapes. Um, you know, right into a 3D software and give it the depth that you actually you know that you actually want. Yeah. Also, hello to Zia in the chat. Welcome on in. Hello, hello. So we're just chilling and making some letters over here. Nothing too crazy. Now, when you're doing designs like this, do you usually have a specific purpose for them? Like, for example, if you're doing a design like this, maybe you're like, oh, this is going to be used specifically for like a t-shirt design I have in mind. Or I guess what I'm saying is, is there always like a specific purpose to these designs or is it sometimes just kind of having fun doing a design stylistically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I would say it's more the latter. Um, I usually don't jump into a design um, specifically like for like merchandise or um, things like that. Most cases, posters will be like top of mind. Um, It's like, all right, this is cool. I think this is something I would kind of would love to see like you know, hanging in my hallway or something like that. Or I would love to give this, you know, at, to like a friend or like my nephews or anything like that. Um, but not necessarily like a, there's not like a like a plan of attack when I'm actually creating a piece. It's more of a, it's really triggered by either I have an opportunity that's coming up that may require this type of skill. So I might do something to be like, okay, let me get in the motion of this, like get the feeling create something that's for myself or just like just my brands in general. Um, and then that way when the opportunity comes up, I'm kind of like already warmed up and ready to jump into it. Um, and in other cases, it may be where if I'm ever working on a project and there's like a concept that I pitched that may not necessarily get accepted, um, but I feel like, you know, 
you know, this is still something that I think can be really fun. Um, that's usually like something where some a time where I'm like, okay, let me just, you know, try this. And like, let me just see like, what would have happened if this would have been accepted or, you know, came through. Um, and most cases it ended up being something that's like, oh, this is like neat. Now I can just like hold on to this and use it for like a later pitch or just have it as part of like the portfolio piece, you know, to kind of see like the range and everything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Did those cases ever happen like, you know, with like your illustrations or just any other pieces that you work on? Is it like there's an intention to have them like on prints or, you know, somewhere? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question because um, if you asked me before, I would say no, it's just random stuff just to put out there. I was just creating art mm-hmm. just because I like creating characters. But the past few years, I think I've really been trying to think more intentionally about like, what am I doing art for? Like, what do I want to mm. do with it long term? Like, where do I want to, what kind of artist do I want to be? Like, just being more introspective, I guess, about what do I want my art to do? Like, you know, because I, I guess I spent so long trying to get good at drawing and painting. Um, mm-hmm. And there was, le- it was almost like more focus on the technical skill, acquiring mm. that. Uh, cause when I started, I may, I kind of felt like I was starting a little bit late. So I was like, Oh, I got to catch up to all these people who are so good at art. Um, mm-hmm. but then there came a point where I was like, really like, well, why am I doing art? Like, what do I want to mm-hmm. do with it? And so at first, no, I would just do characters cause I like doing them, but now it's more project based, I suppose. Like I was kind of thinking like long-term, what do I want to create? And mm-hmm. I came up with some projects that I had in mind. And so now the things I'm doing for those are a lot more intentional and planned. So I guess nice. I kind of made a transition with that recently, but yeah, I guess all my stuff that's personal. I mean, I still do sketches and stuff, you know, I'll just post on Instagram, but mm-hmm. most of the work I'm doing now is uh, for a project. So has mm. a pretty specific purpose. Nice. Nice. Has that like affected the way that you like the way that you look at your work in like, a, like in a positive way or like in a different way than before now that it is more intentional? you know, for like the, I guess, like the project base that you're making them for? Yeah, I think so. Cause I've always been very like emotionally detached from my work. Like all, Mm -hmm. and I guess it's because what I said before, where I was very focused on the, the learning aspect of it, trying to get technically better. So I would just Mm -hmm. look at old pieces and I'd be like, yeah, I I wasn't, I had more lessons I need to learn, you know, I'm better Mm -hmm. now. Like, I don't think that's very good. (laughs) <laughs> but I think it's also because like when I was doing that, if you're doing something just to get better technically, which I, I think is good and valid, but it's like maybe the idea wasn't as thought about, you know what I mean? Mm. I got like maybe the characters not just uninteresting. They're kind of dull, but because I didn't put a lot of thought into it. It was just like a random character. Gotcha. Um, but I think because I'm doing stuff now that's for like a project that I can see this project growing and it's building into something that I hope it will be eventually. Mm -hmm. I look at them more positively maybe because it's like, oh, this is a, you know, this is one of the bricks to, to build the thing I'm trying to build. So Mm -hmm. it's like, I I don't know, I guess it's, it's just a different purpose for it. So I'll look at it a little different in that way. Gotcha. I gotcha. That makes sense. That makes sense. But I think it's, it's kind of like your work, like anything that just adds to that brand, like all your fuzzies, you know, each time you do that, it's part of something bigger. A lot of the stuff I did in the past was like, I don't think about it again. I kind of throw it away. I'll post it online, mm-hmm. but it has no meaning to me after I finish it. But like, if you're doing something for a project or like it's building into part of your brand, I think there's like a certain, um, it feels inherently like more valuable that way. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, it's accomplishing, accomplishing something larger. So I like, right. I like that direction. That's kind of where I'm trying to move more. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I can, I can definitely agree with that. I think that's like, you know, it does, like you said, it does kind of like, you know, it doesn't really affect the way you look at it, but it does, I think it may be affecting like the way you actually like approach the actual piece and how, I guess like more like how you appreciate it in a sense, because you are doing it something that, doing something that's like for a bigger purpose and it has like a, a function to it. Like, you yeah. Said. Yeah. Yeah. It feels more like intentional and useful in that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can understand that for sure. Also, Penny in chat says so dimensional. Yeah, these are really getting like a really cool 3D look to them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
And, you know, like doing this style, it was um, it was kind of a cheat sheet because I I used to be like really jealous of 3D designers early on because <laughs> I didn't have the the patience to learn the the software. And I was like, I can make that. It may not be 3D. <laughs> you can't turn it, but it can be close at least. Um, yeah. Um, but I think that's like I said, I think like doing things that was kind of the part of the process, like learning the technicalities and like the technical, like really like those like minor details that you have to find in the software, like creating these things. So like learning effects, like just like what we talked about today, like learning the um multiply layers and how to make the effects seem like software for shadows and just learning like these different techniques. Um, because like you're chasing after those complex projects, but you may not necessarily know the technical way to make them the proper quote unquote way um you know it kind of gives you a different type of advantage i guess in a sense I, I feel like it's an advantage um other people may see it as like a, a cheat sheet or a workaround either way if you put it all on a print it can still look either the same or very <laughs> or very close yeah i mean there i guess suppose you could get like the same look in 3d if you tried to you know like if you're approaching a stylistically and trying to get it to look the right way but mm -hmm. yeah there's different looks you can get kind of more illustrative and i mean i've seen people do some pretty crazy things with 3d2 like where they do kind of get an illustrative look so i know that is possible but yeah it's really just kind of depends what you're going for yeah absolutely Oops. i imagine if you did do 3d in the future too though like this this background that you have like the aesthetics of, of your illustrations and your lettering and all these 2D processes, like, you know, you could take that and kind of apply it stylistically to be like, almost like you're trying to mimic that style with 3D. So I think a mm -hmm. lot of times when I've seen 2D artists transition into that, there's some like interesting insight they bring. So yeah, yeah there's absolutely. Just so many tools to explore potentially. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it definitely helps you develop an eye for finding colors and spaces that you wouldn't normally look for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we talked about with the last stream, like, um, you know, I, I'm i super appreciative of my professor, but, you know, she used to uh, be really strict about us not using any, like, direct black color. So if you had, like, a black pastel, black crayon, pencil, whatever the case may be, we weren't allowed to use it. Like, you had to mix colors to actually create that black or dark color. Um, and that that lesson alone, and then just like practicing things like this, um, was super helpful to be able to like, you know, have that eye for certain color schemes and certain colors. So, like I said, when you do, if you ever work in like a couple in collaboration for a three D project, and you know, you're maybe like I say, you're art directing or things like that, you're looking for very specific um, things that you wouldn't normally see um, in anything else. So, like. You know, definitely, again, I think it's a still another advantage um, that I think that instances like those can like put you in a different different category. Yeah. And it's like those fundamentals of design and art, you know, color theory, composition, all these things. Yeah. Those are going to be relevant regardless of the medium that you choose. So whether you're doing yeah. like oil painting or you're doing these designs in Illustrator or you're doing them in 3D, like all those fundamental skills are going to be relevant and they're going to transfer. Yeah. A hundred percent. There hasn't been a case where at least that thought process or that, um, you know, type of required, what that type of like medium wasn't like required is very rare that you don't necessarily have to use that mm -hmm. unless it's like done for you, you know? Yeah. Also, Annika asks, um, can we see the full piece now uh, that some letters have the shadows? Oh, yes. Yes. Kind of zoomed out, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, it's just starting to come together. Good call, because yeah. you definitely have to back up <laughs> from your work once you like doing the details. But yeah, but you can start to see like how it's starting to adjust, like based on the things that we've learned. So you see like where we started, like, you know, it wasn't, you know, None of these, I keep referring to the multiply layers because it's just a game changer. But <laughs> um, you start to see like how it's starting to change and evolve over time. But we can always back up, change some things. Um, you know, we just kind of wanted to see like where it's going. But definitely a great call. Uh, I always have to back up to see the full piece. Yeah.
Yeah, it's cool to see that uh, that form kind of from left to right starting to sweep across the piece. 100%. Makes such a big difference. Absolutely. Also, kind of on the topic that we were touching on previously, um, was there anything that helped you find your artistic voice and your style? Like, was it intentional in the way that you went towards it or did it just kind of happen naturally over time? Um, it was a gradual build. Um, at the time where I was getting back into doing a lot more like personal work, specifically, specifically illustration, I uh, invested into an iPad, which, you know, that was something we talked about in the live stream. Um, which really was a big game changer for me to like start doing more digital drawing and have the ability to create something one on the go and not necessarily need to have like a scanner or um, or anything else that I had to like, you know, move my sketches to a desktop somewhere. Um, so, you know, after making that investment, I was, you know, getting back into illustration because I needed kind of an outlet for um, the work that I was doing at the time because it was like a lot of, you know, branding work, you know, like I said, we was, well, I was working with the startup, startups, there was a lot of client based work. So, you know, after a while, like it, it's great, but you know, you have times where like you need to do something that's like creatively like liberating for yourself, you know, just to make sure like you're not seeking approval from anyone. You just kind of like, all right, I'm just making something to make me feel better or like feel good. Um, so I invested in it and I was getting into illustration and, you know, I was just like, just trying a lot of different things and, you know, I was mixing it up with, you know, draw, sketching on iPad and then also sketching, uh, or actually doing more detailed work on Photoshop and just experimenting with like just textures and grains and things like that. I wanted to create more stuff that I can feel. So I didn't have the patience to like do a lot of like portrait drawing like actually like heavy detail like like photorealism type drawings and um which i enjoy seeing them but i started realizing like creating this like i don't have the time <laughs> or i don't want to make the time to spend you know 30 hours on this which would be great um so i wanted to do something that was kind of simple that allowed me to get a lot of ideas out where i didn't have to wait until i finished one piece to do the next one or i if i did have to wait it wasn't long um so just you know trial and error and getting inspiration from a lot of just the cartoons that i was enjoying when i was younger so a lot of nostalgic inspiration were people like uh skeeter from doug um the imaginary homes what well, is the home for imaginary friends um just seeing how those characters all had their their individual like characteristics about them that make them unique and like you know there's a great documentary out there about like why that show was like impactful as it was um and, you know like i wanted to create something that gave me like a feeling of just culture without being very literal like in a sense like how can i capture you know, someone that I saw or someone that I encounter like on a daily basis or every so often in a way that feels like them, but you can't necessarily tell that's them. Um, but you also, you can just feel like this is the person I'm talking about. Um, so just creating these these characters and just simplifying their looks, you know, it's stumbled across like what we see now with, with fuzzies and just, you know, finding something that like felt really good. Um, and just putting it on repeat, right? I wanted this, wanted it to become something that was like a universe and um, have it become something that like I can build a world around that, you know, I can just continue to add to those collection. Because at first it was just something to, you know, get away from. Like, you know, when I'm off work, all right, I'm gonna go create some fuzzy characters or like these illustrations and then let me just add them to the archive. And then over time, you know, after sharing it for a while, um, I had an opportunity to actually apply that style to some client work um, that came like down the road. And that ultimately like motivated me to create it as his own brand, which is, you know, again, uh, a long time in the making, but you know, that's kind of where it like kind of sparked from just really just getting away and just investing into just creative equipment to create something that is, I can call my own, but now ultimately share with everyone else. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of that is really just like a gradual process of mm -hmm. kind of trying things, growing, learning. Yeah. But, uh, I'm always interested in how people kind of, you know, come about to their to their own aesthetic and style. Yeah. 
it's definitely result a lot of trial and error to um just trying things and like like i said being a part of a startup you're especially as a creative you're probably going to try a bunch of mediums that you are not familiar with so you learn pretty quickly as far as what it is that you like to do and the things that you never want to do again <laughs> yeah for sure yeah um also you you mentioned that a documentary that talked about like why certain shows were as impactful as they were uh, mm -hmm. what was that about yeah so there is a great youtube channel um called nerd nerd nostalgic um so it's n-e-r-d uh s-t-a-l i no wait nostalgic <laughs> yeah s-t-a-l-g-i-c yeah. yeah nerd nostalgic um it's a great channel um I I've been following it for a long time. It was another guy that was like hosting it, but I think he's working on a, a movie now as a result of the channel. Um, but he does a really great job of breaking down kind of the best and worst like episodes of a series or talks about like it's a um shows as a whole, um, and really kind of shape a different perspective like of what those shows were going through at the time that they were airing and even before like they actually became what they are and what we know them um as today and it, it, it like it goes to the history of like the artists like who the artist was around and what challenges they were facing when they were pitching those concepts to you know the networks um there's a really great one on spongebob which i think is super epic um there's one like on futurama which is a really another great one um but it does a really good job of just giving you insight on like why we enjoyed those shows and then why certain episodes and the idea of storytelling um like impacted us as like when we were kids when we were watching it like i didn't realize why i love the show so much but now it makes it makes sense on why i was able to relate to it yeah yeah it's cool that sounds like that's like right up my alley so thanks for telling me about that because oh I, yeah uh, i grew up with like all those shows so i'd love to check that out oh yeah no you're, you're you're gonna love it like it's a really great like show to like have on like in the background if you're ever working because it gives a lot of great insight on just like why certain shows and obviously it's more um opinionated than anything yeah um but there's a lot of like history behind it and there's you know you know it kind of makes most of it makes sense yeah i mean it's super interesting to hear like analysis of that stuff because like when you're a kid you don't obviously think about it you just have this nostalgia for it you know mm -hmm. you enjoyed it but like hearing someone analyze it a bit is uh, usually very insightful yeah also no, annika Annika's reminding us that it's uh, artist spotlight time. The time oh, flies awesome. by, but yeah, we can, uh, whenever you're at a good stopping point with this, we can jump over into the artist spotlight. And then um, we should have like a little bit of time, maybe um, 10 to 15 minutes after it, that you can kind of finish up what you're doing here. Absolutely. Yeah. So I will put this artist in the chat. Um, I don't know, Annika, if you have this link, but I'll put them there. Uh, but yeah, we can just uh, go through some of their projects. I was looking over this before the stream. And I mean, the setup of their website alone is like really well organized and awesome. But I was just like yeah. blown away by these projects that they've done. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the artist that, you know, that we're spotlighting today is um, uh, Ade Hogue. Uh, he is a lettering artist. I think he was born and raised out of North Carolina, but he, uh, he lived in Chicago um for a large part of his career um and he was a, he was a big inspiration to me as i was you know really setting foot into just the space um i learned of him probably learned of him probably back in like 20 probably 2017 or 2018 around the time um you know he was just another one of those designers you know or black designers that literally like was a big like like big part of representation and what it meant to be like a black designer in this space. Um, just his skills with lettering, his, you know, his skills with type and just his overall like um, character and demeanor, at least from what I've known of him um, as we, you know, we talked online uh, was, you know, super inspiring. It kind of gave me a blueprint of what I wanted to aim for as far as like just being a artist in this space or just creative in this space and just seeing like how you know his personal um 
the personal things that he enjoyed bled into his work. So he was athletic, you know, he loved to be a part, he loved Chicago, just like the, just the state as a general. Um, and he loved to be like, you know, very hands-on. So he's multidimensional, has a lot of great like clientele that he's worked with and um, pretty much as an overall like well like round uh creative um unfortunately he did pass um i think it was like a year ago um due to like just a, a accident and um you know it's kind of been tough like with him not being around but i wanted to highlight him uh just so you know our listeners are more aware of who he is and just some of the work that he's you know done in his past and, and just like how much he was an inspiration to me um to where i am today uh, but he has, you know, a great family. They have foundations that are in his name. Um, and, you know, they had a tribute with him uh, a few, I think it was like a few months ago um, at his college at, I think it was the University of North Carolina or UNC, I believe. Um, but again, another great artist. Uh, I think, you know, he had, his family has left his work up, um, but you can see his work everywhere. You probably have already seen his work. Um, but again, just another great like inspiration that I wanted just to highlight, um, you know, for the artist spotlight. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this work is like, there's such a, um, a range to the work that he's done mm -hmm. stylistically and just like the application of it. But yeah, this is really impressive. The presentation has blown me away too. Yeah. How, how well this is all laid out and like how it's documenting the design, but largely like the application of it too, like how these are put up in the space that they were designed mm -hmm. for. So you can really see um, the intention behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Even this guy, yeah, yeah video documenting it. It's yeah. <laughs> so well done. A hundred percent. Yeah, so you kind of see he was very, very versatile and just the way he approached his work and, you know, just his um, his love for letters and, you know, everything else was just like huge. Um, you know, he has this like really nice collection of just, you know, things he's made in the past. Um, I'm trying to see, I don't know if he has it on um, his site, but one of my favorite pieces, which is one, this is one of them, this week on Be All Right, which is uh, Ken, Kendrick Lamar inspired, uh, and this Nah as well, <laughs> which was the uh, um, the word of word of the past couple of years. Um, but one of my favorite pieces of him is all time was the one he, one of his tributes to Nipsey Hussle, which I thought was amazing. So uh, don't know if he has it on here, but if you ever visit a site, take a look through it. And uh, you know, get familiar with the foundation. It's uh, his family is amazing. So, yeah, yeah. The way he incorporates shape into all these like type is just really, really interesting. Like re really visually interesting and well done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, like these, these have such a, a thought of like the overall shape that the text creates or the symbols mm -hmm. combine with them. So, I love absolutely. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's definitely um, definitely someone that like loves to be like hands on. So you can kind of see that you know he he must rather be be away from the computer if he can help it, and more yeah. to like the studio or the camera um, to actually get like really nice things. And you know his um, his love for type is you know obviously unmatched. So yeah, that's really cool to see this too. Like something type, um, which is you know usually graphic design we consider doing all, all that on the computer but bringing this into mm -hmm. such like a physical space with these shots here absolutely um and even his use of paper like being able to have like this flat but 3d look um you know it's just mind-blowing like just to be able to have like some of these messages um you know he's done a lot of work especially around like when you know things like voting like history month um in general like he's kind of someone that you know, we tend to look to, uh, it's almost like kind of like you waiting on it, like this big premiere. Like, I know he's going to make something pretty, pretty dope, uh, for the occasion. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm really impressed with like all these different skills that he's, um, showing like this, this paper, you know, and then that last one with the photography, with the food, mm -hmm. like they're all very different, but he's just killing it for all of these. Yeah, absolutely. 
yeah so you see he's like even at scale um yeah because some of his pieces are like really huge and have um yeah you can even just see the scale like of this one like you can see like how, I don't know. I can't remember how tall he was, <laughs> but I can only imagine if he was as close to where I am. Like, well, that is a big piece of blue paper. <laughs> yeah, I love the applications of these designs. Like the creative ways mm -hmm. he's bringing them to life is so unique. Yeah, absolutely. And like the use of color is just like you know, really nice to look at. It's easy on the eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, really easy on the eye. Very readable designs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even his like involvement on like, you know, pieces of work that like on a larger scales, like with this work with the Black Messiah, with which that came out last year. Um, but be able to be, you know, do some art direction behind some of the soundtrack was, you know, super dope. Annika says, I love the movement in these designs. Yeah, there's a lot of energy to these. Yeah. And even if these are digital, it still feels like very hands on, almost like, you know, it's very complimentary to what he's done with the lettering, like, you know, like putting things together, like even digitally, he still has like that kind of look and feel. Yeah, I'm really impressed with the just the sheer amount of work, too, because it's not like these are you know, small one-off designs, there's right. the application is so emphasized, like here it's showing all the pictures that this had to, you know, this was applied to. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, these aren't, you know, quick little one-off designs. It's like, but there's so much of it too. Absolutely. This is a really good example. If anyone's ever like, like, I feel like I'm pretty weak in presentation with presenting my work and how you display and show it but this is a great mm -hmm. example of how to do that oh yeah for sure yeah he was definitely a um a big guide on that and um and he's he's even had like you know uh resources where you know he's he's given out booklets around like how to use a pen tool for lettering which was super helpful for me um but yeah, but presentation is like always huge. Like just the use of really nice topography to show off like the physical products as well. Um, and again, you can just see kind of his use of letters and lettering, like really, you know, bring this together. Yeah, the uh, the combination of the 2D designs with like the professional level, you know, photography makes a really big impact. For sure, for sure. I think photography, um, I've recently been getting into it, but I feel like it's a, a great supplement to almost like any artist because it seems like there's a lot of uses for it mm -hmm. when like presenting your work potentially. Oh yeah, for sure. No, it, it makes a big difference. Like, you know, like tie faces and all that. It, it tells the story just as much as your actual work does. Yeah, and, and seeing these... Um, these designs and context is always so interesting because you know they're blown up to such a large scale. They're defining the look of an entire room. Uh, the first image that I saw that was the very first one on the page is the Alaska Airlines. Like seeing your mm -hmm. design on a plane, you know, that's just yeah, just wild to see it small on a screen versus blown up yeah. on something like that, <laughs> right? And it works so well. Absolutely. No, I can imagine that feeling of having yeah. literally something you made like on a plane. For sure. Like I was like, that's <laughs> that's gotta be a highlight. Right. But, but even the the interest of just like adapting that design, knowing it has to fit on this this certain shape that the plane is, this kind of long cylindrical tubular mm -hmm. thing. Um, it's really interesting, kind of how I'm sure he was very like well aware of the context of all these different designs, whether it's on a wall or a plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's cool. I yeah, it's neat that he was able to like bring, you know, some of his work in like really real, like you said, practical settings where like, you know, you can actually have it as something that functions versus something that you actually just read or see. Yeah, the uh, the ability to take these designs and adapt them to so many different situations so effectively is, is really admirable because I feel like I would, 
you know, have trouble with that. Like, oh, I've never put something on a wall or I've never made something into a rug, but like, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what the application is. It's, it's just nailing it. Right, exactly. Nah, definitely, definitely a, a versatile creative. A hundred percent. Trying to see, I think that was, oh, he still has a couple more. Yeah, I was going to say, um, at any point, if you just want to show off whichever ones are left, we can jump back into yours, uh, your work, whenever mm -hmm. you're ready, of course. Okay, okay. Yeah, we uh, can jump into it. This can be the last one. I love this design. That's so cool. Like, more paperwork. And, right. like, stylistically, it's so it's so different, you know, from these serious brands that are very um, more, like, maybe muted colors versus mm -hmm. something that's so playful. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, he did a great job of like documenting like the behind the scenes and the process of like building some of these. Uh... Such a wide skill set with him, like all these things. Mm -hmm. I love that. Absolutely. Yep. So definitely one of the the biggest inspiration for me. So yeah, I can see why. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a great uh great pick for the artist spotlight. For sure. All right. So um, let's see. We I would say we have about uh, 10 minutes or so for whatever you want to use that for before the end of the stream. OK. Yeah. I mean, I think um, based on what we've done before, like it's really just kind of rinse and repeat at this point. So um, I mean, I can work to, to do everything. Um, you know, kind of clear the time out, but um, stay available to answer any questions. Um, but again, if people want to just follow my work, of course, I'm at Behance. At, you can find my profile here on the stream as well. But if you want to follow my Instagram, is at Fuzzies Co. Um, you can also follow Fuzzies at, on Twitter as well. Um, just Fuzzies Co. again. And also at HankDesigns.com if you want to see the studio's work uh, as well. So, yeah. Cool. Do you think this is one uh, you might finish up off stream? Yeah, definitely. So if you are following me, I I uh, definitely have a plan to finish this up and I would love to share it with you all and just, you know, kind of see where we started and ultimately see where where it ends up being. But uh, it's been fun to be able to get this far with it and kind of take everyone's suggestions uh, from the stream and, you know, kind of work, work through it. Yeah, for sure. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on your Instagram to see uh, see the finished thing eventually. Absolutely. And yeah, just a reminder to chat, we do have maybe about nine, 10 minutes somewhere in there um, left with Hank. So if you have any questions, put it in the chat and I can relay them over. Any comments or questions or anything like that. Absolutely. Yeah, looks like chat is very impressed by the uh, artist sp spotlight today. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, so we're just going to keep repeating these techniques and I'm going to go in and add a little bit more detail off stream. And then, yeah, I think we're going to have something we can be proud of. When you uh, you were talking a little bit about like adding that fuzzy um, texture and feel to the letters, is that mostly done through the noise uh, pass? Yeah, and... Um, in this case, uh, we because of just like it being the letters and the noise, I think complements this well. Um, in other cases, I do have custom brushes that I use for that um, that fuzzy effect. Now that process does take a little bit longer than um, you know isolating an area, like painting it, and add, adding that um, noise effect. But it does give it a different type of grit. And what we're what I'm learning now and evolving to is like giving different types of fuzzy textures to different types of mediums. So if it's kind of lettering, certain types of textures respond better than others. And I think in this case, like the noise effect, um, I think it's doing that pretty well uh, based on what, we, what we're making right now. Okay, nice. Yeah. Alessandra says, love how this is coming out. Yeah. Seeing it kind of become 3D all of a sudden is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. 
No, I appreciate appreciate you all uh, taking this uh, journey with me for sure. Yeah, I love the saturated colors too. That's a lot. For sure. No, the the multi multiplying thing is just like it's just changed the game for me. <laughs> so glad. probably next time I'm just like, <laughs> just like, yeah, that's, I'm gonna make sure that's like a big step we follow <laughs> for I, everything else. I always say that I think multiply layer is like my most used blending mode. So it's a favorite. <laughs> for sure. Do you have a tool or anything that's just like, I don't know, something you use all the time that you love? Because I would say I have a couple like blending mode, for example, that's just a staple for me. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, man, Um. I think in, you know, in Illustrator, I think that's like the, the blend tool is probably like the most, I don't want to say the most used, but it is... It is definitely a go-to. I think it's like one of those tools, like if I need like a specific solution, I'm gonna look to see like, all right, can the blend tool do this? <laughs> yeah. If, like, if not, like, how can I make it work? You know, um, I, I don't know with Photoshop, I feel like it's, I don't know if there's like one that like sticks out above the other. Um, you know, I think, you know, I probably say the blend modes, I think it's kind of like the, probably like one of the I think most used and I think the most like useful um outside of like you know cases like this where we're like creating like this 3D effect with brushes but if yeah. I'm ever working on like a specific graphic or like you know maybe doing like a photo uh composite or anything like that like the blend modes tend to like be like a huge factor um so I'll, I'll give it up to them I'll, I'll give them I'll give the blend modes that uh that praise yeah a lot of a lot of versatility there for sure Yeah, I started to see this really come come together. Oh, and this is the E. Okay. And this is the K's. We'll say K's and shadows. Carol says, uh, I love the copywriting on your what website. For, oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> it hasn't gone unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and annika put the links for your uh your website and your instagram in the chat thanks annika oh, awesome awesome yeah and definitely make sure to to visit fuzzies.co as well if you guys join the newsletter um we're gonna be making some announcements pretty soon just everything for us like new apparel um things as well and just upcoming events that we have for the remainder of the year um along with things that we have planned for next year which you know we have some really big plans um to be out and about and you know hopefully you guys hopefully you guys will see a lot more uh fuzzies or things that remind you of fuzzies you know out in the world i was curious um when you said you were working in-house and uh, you started doing freelance on the side as well with that. Mm -hmm. Where did you initially start finding clients? Was it through uh, the connections that you had at the startup or did you find the clients another way? Uh, that's a great question. So early on, it was um, it was some re definitely referral just from people that I've worked with in-house. Um, there were cases where um, there were certain clients that come to the agency that didn't necessarily fit what we were offering at the time or had something that we didn't necessarily like sold, sell or anything. Um, and just because of the relationship I had with them, they knew that I was doing things more independently and like things on the side. So like, you know, a lot of referrals came through them and said, hey, they, you know, either they can't afford us or they are asking for something that we don't necessarily sell as a company. But if you want to do that independently, you know, you know, you have our permission and things like that. And that, you know, that came from just having like a great relationship with them. Um, so early on, I think that was, that was like the, like, I guess 
the big turning point of getting like clients when it's like you getting it from your um from your job but before that you know it was definitely um the family also so like you know helping things with my family at first um and then just close friends and ultimately it became like more word of mouth um uh, early on i was doing a lot of things just free just to learn uh or just to even just to be in a space of certain people and um Luckily enough, it paid off. I don't recommend it all the time, but you know, I think there are certain there are certain opportunities that can pay you more than just like like transaction like just cash or anything. Um, but you have to kind of be really careful like how you decipher those. So yeah. early on, I gambled a little bit, but that was it paid off ultimately. So, but in short, definitely the turning point like the early like clientele was just like referrals that came from. The relationships that I had in my start at the startup I was at. Yeah, that's a cool situation to be in where the company you're working for is cool with you, like taking on, mm -hmm. you know, the clients, but just a little bit independently on the side. So that's great. Yeah. Great situation yeah. to be in. Yeah, I definitely don't take that experience for granted. I think that was, you know, just the just the people that I was around and, you know, they were super supportive and wanted to see me wanted to see me win. So I always, you know, stay grateful for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Also, just a little heads up um, to you in the chat. It looks like we just have we're in our last couple minutes here before we got to sign off for the day. Oh, it's so hard to say goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been really cool just like watching this kind of slowly transition from 2D to 3D. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Looking, absolutely. I'll have to catch the rest of it uh, if you post it on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, I think this uh, this will be my homework for tonight. It's kind of a nice little uh, little getaway. Yeah, utilize that rain if you got the relaxing rain in the background. Yeah, Get on some music <laughs> for sure. Hopefully, it doesn't rain too hard. I do want. I would love to like, at least get outside a little bit today. Yeah, <laughs> I do find it like harder to concentrate when it's. A, I mean, I live in LA, so it's usually nice here. But like when it's sunny and mm -hmm. nice, and there's stuff going on outside. It's a little bit harder to concentrate than if it's like overcast, yeah. <laughs> maybe sprinkling a bit, everything's quiet. Yeah. No, I get that. But yeah, I think this might be a good place to, to call it. Um, once again, if anyone is just coming and you can see the design that he's worked on, this is something we've been doing the past two days. I want to thank everyone for coming out and watching these streams, hanging out with us, talking with us. And Hank, once again, uh, where can people find you? And um, yeah, any any closing remarks you want to make? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you all again for watching. You can find me at hankdesigns.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Fuzzies Co. At Twitter at Fuzzies Co. as well. And make sure you follow at fuzzies follow us at fuzzies.co to see more fuzzies and just things that we have um, around there. And um, again, it's always a pleasure to be um back here to be able to create in front of you all and just like share you know this creative experience with you all um and until next time i can't wait to can't wait to be back all right awesome hank it's been great thanks so much uh thanks for joining everyone we'll see you next time thank you